Let's continue our worship by going to our Father and pray. You are indeed our King, and it is indeed mind-boggling that you, our King, should die for its subjects. Father, it's a love that is so remarkable that at times it's unbelievable. And sometimes it's hard to grasp why a God who did not consider equality with God something to be grasped will make himself lower than the angels and become one of us. And Father, be subjected to human laws and human unkindness. And Father, we're grateful though. We're grateful that your son was willing to die for our sins. And I pray tonight as we worship you, as we sing songs to you, as we sing songs about you, as we sing songs to each other, that, Father, we honor your name above all. And, Father, I pray that all that we do tonight comes up to you as sweet incense, as holy, acceptable to you. We praise all through that unblemished son of yours. We pray through his holiness. We pray because with gratitude because of his death, because it meant life for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So we shall continue with uh, the last part, if you would, uh, the next uh, couple of days here with our, um, with our series on mental health. And we'll talk a little bit about what's going on in our community at large and even uh, how to respond, uh, I believe, uh, in regard to the scriptures. And so some of the things that we've talked about, of course, I'll, I'll review just ever so briefly, that it's important to have good mental health. And good mental health leads to good emotional health because the way that we think is the way that we will act and it's the way that we will ultimately feel uh, because we have the right mentality and therefore we'll have the right emotions because we are acting the right way. And there are some examples of, of uh, some good um, uh, attributes to mental health. Now, we're not talking about the fact about mental illness. There, that, that's a different story altogether. I'm talking about schizophrenia, multiple personality, um, depression, bipolar, uh, and so on and so forth, and uh, at a clinical level. But we're talking here about it's important, especially at this time, and even coupled with the fact of the perfect storm of quarantine and the, the, the tension, the political and racial tension that's uh, really all across the world, and not to mention, of course, coupled with the medical uh, tension that we feel with COVID-19. And there are a lot of things that are going our way, um, or at least coming our way, and sometimes it can be hard to navigate. And we've talked about the fact that um, to have a good mental health is to have a great, deep sense of purpose of why we get together. We talked about the fact that even companies that do not even have a necessarily a spiritual purpose yet finds uh, uh, a great uh, ability to deal with what they're doing and be successful because there's a great sense of purpose uh, that they have. We talked about the fact that we ought to have strong relationships. And uh, even if uh, uh, some of those are not spiritual, I mean, just the, the fact that the, you know, the universal truth of being connected and having great relationships are shown in why people join clubs, people join teams and what they feel there. And on the flip side, even gangs and, and, and there's community centers and so on and so forth. But th th that there's a great sense of connection and community that helps us to, uh, uh, to feel um, the right thing, to, uh, uh, to think the right things um, on a whole. Um, and then having a great sober estimation of who we are and what we are and not to think too highly of ourselves, not to think too low to lowly of ourselves. I think those are very, very important dynamic. And today what I want to talk about is uh, two more things, uh, and I'll quickly go over them. Um, the idea of stress and the idea also of having um, uh, an enjoyable life, a life that you actually really enjoy. In Matthew chapter 6, at the end of Matthew, um, uh, 
it writes and it says, uh, do not worry for tomorrow will worry about itself. Now, that was a very curious statement, especially in light of the context, because from Matthew 6, verse 26, all the way to uh, 33, uh, the writer of Matthew writes, and he says this, don't worry about what you should eat, what you should wear. Now, come on. I can't walk around without eating any food. I can't walk around without actually wearing any clothes. And, 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 and so the writer says, no, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. And, and the writer addresses the issue of where our priority is. You see, when our priority are not in the right place, then it can bring about a sense of stress that is not helpful. It brings about a sense of worry. And yet, if we are of this kingdom, this kingdom that Jesus created, he says, seek first this kingdom. Seek his righteousness first. And these things... Oh, I know that you need them. And that's what it says in the, in the scriptures. But the idea is where do we place our priority? And one of the ways, honestly, to deal with stress and worry is where are our priorities in our lives? That's one thing. Another thing that he addresses um, in Luke chapter 12, uh, and I'll just refer to these scriptures, Jesus makes the incredible statement that a man's life does not consist of the abundance of his possessions. In other words, it's not talking about whether or not you're living, obviously. He's talking about your quality of life. That life that is truly life is not measured by how many toys we have. It's not measured by even the quality of the toys we have or the size of the house that we live in, or size of car that we drive. And Jesus says, when we understand that, that our life and therefore our desire to build bigger barns and, and, and put these toys in these barns, and he asks the question, if you were to die, who's going to use them? And if we spend our life Going after these things, it, it brings about a sense of stress. I remember I was talking to a brother that I had a great relationship with in Chicago, and, and he, had, he had just had a significant promotion where he had an increase of pay by $150,000 a year. And, and not, his pay was to $150,000. It was increased by $150,000 a year. And he says, awesome, man, I am going to really, really uh, do some things to my house. I'm going to, I'm going to uh, uh, just put a whole bunch of renovations into my house. I'm going to put about a half a million dollar renovations into my house. And I said, oh, I thought you got a raise. You meant the bank got a raise, not you. And, 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 and so the idea is sometimes when we think, well, that's what our life is. Now, no one's talking about whether or not you should have a big house or small. That's not the idea. But our life that is truly life, that's not what it consists of. You know, it's an interesting thing. I grew up in a house where literally there was one bedroom for nine of us. Mom and dad slept in the bedroom and the seven of us slept on the floor. I'm not talking we went to a cottage and that's what it was. We lived like that for a while. And there was not a time in my life at that time I thought, boy, how hard is my life? Maybe my parents did, but I didn't think, oh my gosh, I, life is so difficult. The quality of my life was measured in the relationships that I had with my brothers and my sisters and the relationship I had with my mom and dad. And the quality of one's life. And a lot of times we stress out. And, and we realize, what are we all doing it for anyways? 
And the question that we're asking, that I'm asking, even as you think about your life right now, is it leading to a life that is measured in the abundance of your possessions? Because Jesus distinctly says, that's not what it is. And, and that ultimately leads to stress. And, you know, it's an interesting thing. I was, I sat down with a brother in Boston. And these things sometimes can be so unrelatable to us. And he said to me, he was, he was worth about $100 million. And, um, and he said to me, he said, Tony, uh, um, since I've become wealthy in a lot of people's eyes, there's a lot of stress that I never thought I would have. He said, the truth is, if I didn't feel that God has given me to be a steward of this money, I would gladly give it away. Because what it has brought into my life is a lot of things that I never thought I would even have to worry about. He said ultimately he wants to die with not a penny in his bank because he wants to give it away to, to, to the ultimately the propagation of the gospel. But the idea here is that sometimes we can get caught up in the fact that we run after these things. And do we have stress and worry that we bring on to ourselves? by this society imposed, maybe even family imposed things that says, hey, this is what my life is like. You know, oftentimes when I with my kids, we were growing up and, and uh, my kids would come and say, well, they get to do this or they get that. And uh, one of the mantras that we had in this family was, now, what's your last name? Okay. And what's their last name? Okay. Well, that family is not this family. And, uh, you know, we chuckle about it uh, uh, now, but the whole idea is that there are times that is incredibly tempting, incredibly tempting to get caught up with the abundance of my possessions as to a measurement of my quality of life. And so we chase after these things and ultimately bring on stress even onto our own lives. And Jesus says, that's not what, I mean, which is anti what the health and wealth gospel talks about, right? But, but that's another story for another time. But Jesus says, that's not how you measure the quality of one's life. Or in uh, Philippians chapter 4, uh, it says uh, that do not worry, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything present your prayer and your petitions before God. And the peace of God which transcends all understanding regards your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. One of the ways uh, to deal with stress is through prayer and, and meditation and, and to quote unquote, pray through your stress. Because one of the things sometimes what happens uh, is that when stress comes, we try to deal with it in other ways. And, and, and not that there aren't other ways to deal with stress, but one of the ways that we ought to be able to deal with the things that come about, because stress is in this society is unavoidable. Actually, in any society, it's unavoidable. It's why Jesus talks about it. But the idea is coping with stress and do we have some mechanisms? And so to me, the two things that we're talking about, there's an immediacy in which we can deal with stress. That is through meditation, through prayer, through reaching out to people. When we're feeling a little bit stressed and some of the signs of stress is feeling anger, irritated, not being able to sleep. And, and you can feel it rising in you. And some of us are good at recognizing when those things are happening and we reach out or we go and meditate or we go and pray. Some of us have different coping mechanisms, drinking, drugs, illicit relationships, spending sprees. And, and, and so it's really, really important 
that the, the first parts that I talked about is the idea of forming a foundation that you're living within an infrastructure so that you are not being pressed and, and you're not being pressured into living a stressful life. This one talks a little bit about how do you deal when the stress actually comes to have prayer and time of meditation and reaching out to others, which is going to be involved in also community. Another thing that it says that uh, 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 is to be able to um, bear each other's, carry each other's burdens. And, and that, that, that is in conjunction with reaching out. You know, th that idea of just reaching out to others, oftentimes what I find is that I, when I'm not feeling the way I need to be feeling, I don't necessarily feel at that point in time to reach out to people. And, 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 and uh, providentially, a lot of times God reaches out to me through a phone call <coughs> and, and somebody talks to me. But so I want to encourage you, man, if, you, if, if it's right there with you, carry each other's burdens, reach out to someone, call them, talk to them especially with what's going on in our world right now. Tomorrow, like I've shared, is going to be the memorial for a brother that, who was part of the congregation for the longest time and found it very difficult to deal with the community uh, and what was going on in the world. And it's a challenge. And so while that is very difficult, there are other ways that we can be harboring stress. Stress literally kills. And we've got to be able to deal with this. And I think sometimes we think it's a sign of weakness if I feel stress. That I'm not handling my business if I feel stress. I'm here to tell you there are ways that we can uh, um, get away from it, th that it doesn't invade our life. But even if it does, there's some mechanisms that we have to prayer, to meditation, to reaching out and you reaching out and, and people reaching out to you and, and having the humility to accept that in your life. And, and, and the idea of being connected to one another, enjoying life, figure out what do you like to do? That's another way. What, what are some things that is important for you. The, the, the idea of self-care, not selfishness. The idea of self-care is not to use it as an excuse for me to be solely self-indulgent, but for me to figure out what do I enjoy? What do I like to do? Do you like to read books? Great. Do you like to go for walks? Awesome. Do you like to go camping? Fantastic. Do you like the outdoors? Great. Do you like to watch movies? Awesome. Do you like to play sports? Great. Whatever, you need to find that aspect of your life to be able to cope and have all facets of your life that is ultimately going to be addressed. So hopefully these things would have helped you a little bit, you know, as, as we go through all these times in our lives here. And, uh, and honestly, and with conjunction, I wanted to address a little bit as well one of the things that is going on in our society right now. And in Romans chapter 15, uh, this will form a, a, as a backdrop of some of the stuff that we've talked about um, a, a little earlier. In Romans chapter uh, uh, 15, I'll put these scriptures together in verse seven. Paul writes, and he says this, accept one another then, just as Christ accepted you, in order to bring praise to God. In John chapter 17, in John chapter 17, in verse 23, there's a statement here that is so remarkable. It's almost hard to believe. And so we'll put these things together. Jesus makes a statement in John chapter 17, verse 23. He says this. Let's start in 22. I have given them the glory that you gave me, 
that they may be one as we are one. I and them and you and me. So that they may be brought to complete unity. Then, then, the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you've loved me. Jesus makes a statement here that is so remarkable. He says, the world will know that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, the unblemished sacrifice, the one who is to come, the one who is going to rescue Israel, that he will be who recognized based on our unity. Not how well we sing songs, not how even accurate our doctrine is. That with John chapter 13, a couple chapters earlier, we sort of see the same theme. In John chapter 13, in verse 34, he says this, A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. Check it out. By this, what? Your love one for another. Everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. There is an idea that John is communicating here, that the love and unity of one another is how the world would recognize, the world at large will recognize that you are disciples and that Jesus is indeed from God. That he was the one who was to come. That he was the prophesied one. He was the chosen one. One of the things that is happening now is this idea of a lot of responses to the coronavirus. There's a lot of people who are saying, man, this is a hoax. Should we even do this? Look how many people are getting hurt. Let's open it up. Let's have herd immunity. There are some people who are saying this is you can't do that. You don't love people if you do. Uh, you're putting people at risk. And so they're literally well-intentioned people who are on both sides of that. And they, it can bring about some significant tension. That in conjunction with this idea of what has been an awakening in the world, not only North America, in the world, with George Floyd's death. And it's brought about a sense of awakening in injustices and the prejudice in people's life. And how do we respond? How do we respond in the context of being in this kingdom? I think the Bible helps us to understand. It says to accept one another and to be unified and to love one another. Now, how do we do that? Let me explain what unity is not. Unity is not conformity. In other words, you don't have to do what I do in order for me to be unified with you. And, and so I can't force you to feel something that you don't feel. And the Bible says be careful not to cast judgment on others because they don't feel what you feel. And the reverse is not true as well. It's true as well. But because I am doing something that you don't feel, and so let me get specific. There are some people who think the world should stop and we should go and protest and do this. And there are some people who think they don't see the value in it. Here's what I'm saying. One of the dispositions that we ought to have at this point in time is to seek to understand instead to be understood, first of all. Why does this person think the way they do? On both sides. In that way, we can accept one another and actually be unified and be a testimony to the world that this is how people from different communities, different backgrounds, different line of thinking, think and feel about certain things. 
This is already dangerous enough. We were sitting and talking as a family, meaning my, my brothers and sisters about how to deal with my mom and that she has moderate to mild dementia. There are seven children in the family of which I'm the youngest, as you can probably imagine, that there are different ways to go about dealing with this. The people have had experiences that are different experiences. And it got really, really tense to the point where, and I may have shared this before, one of my brothers was cursing out my other brother and sister. Now you gotta understand, that's not the way this family rolls. Like we, that's not the way we talk. I've never heard any of my brothers and sisters swear. And they're not disciples. And so we don't talk like, but this, and, and, and so I said to the family, I said, listen, this is hard enough to deal with. Let's not make it harder by being divided and, and, and losing our relationship because this disease is tough enough. Let it not only affect and put its network into us as well and break us. And I said this, I said, 30 years ago, I had a tear in my shoulder and, and to this day, I cannot throw a ball as hard as I would like to because that tear has never been fully healed. It is important that Satan does not win in our different dispositions and create rips and tears in our relationship. Not that it, that shoulder is not functioning, but that it's not functioning at its highest level. And so the call here is to figure out how do I respond? Well, what does the Spirit of God put in your heart? And ask the lending question, how can I help? You know, it's interesting. When Jesus went to the home of the Pharisees, of the sinner rather, and the woman was washing his hair, her, his foot with her hair, it's amazing how people saw that differently. Some people looked at it and said, how can he waste the money? Do you not realize we could sell it? And, and Jesus says, She's doing it. She loves much because she's been forgiven much. Same situation, two different responses. When the parable of the prodigal son was, I'll talk a little bit more about this on Sunday. When the parable of the prodigal son was, was, um, was talked about, there was this celebration of killing the fatted calf or putting a ring on his finger or a robe on his back. And there was a massive celebration. And what did the older brother? He had a different disposition as to what was going on. But he saw something else. When the man who was, had a mat and he, and, and he was hurt, and Jesus went up to him and said, pick up your mat and walk. And there are people who were totally offended that he would do this on the Sabbath. And other people praise God. And so the idea is this. There are things that we all see and we see things differently. The message of Jesus Christ talks about acceptance and bearing with one another and loving one another, being so unified, not conforming to each other, but being so unified. To be able to say, man, I see you. I don't feel the same way, but I see you. How can I help? Is there a more egregious thing that has been done in this world than the trampling on the Son of God and treating his blood as an unholy thing? 
Yet there are people who respond differently to that. And our message is to preach the gospel with love, patience, and careful instruction. And so if someone is moved to go and protest, amen, how can I help? If someone isn't, hey, how can I help? That's what being under this umbrella of Jesus Christ, community and this community that we have, it shapes and helps us to understand what Christianity is ultimately all about. There is no other community where people from all different walks of life could come in and sit down and actually engage and be a light to this world by the way we treat one another. To be faithful and effective, the church must go beyond so-called fellowship and to embody a counterculture and giving the world to understand what true unity and what true love is like. That's beyond, hey bro, how are you doing? That's trying to understand why somebody thinks the way that they do. Whether they agree with you or they don't agree with you. When I was a younger man, I thought I was right about everything. And you know what my justification was? I'm a Christian and I feel strongly about it and this is what it says. I'll tell you this, when I'm thinking right, when someone doesn't think like I do, I try to understand why do you think the way you do? Is there trauma? Is there an experience? When I found out my mom hasn't slept since 1963 throughout the night and she was afraid to go to sleep it was because she feared of her life and the life of her children. I thought it was other issues. It cast a different light. And how that has affected her dementia and Alzheimer's, starting with atrocities. And so if someone is not as concerned or someone is way concerned, ask why do they think and feel the way they do? That's what accepting one another is all about under the umbrella of Jesus Christ. It is important to exhibit Christ-likeness, not only as individuals, but as a body as a unified body of Christ. And then the world will know that he is the one that who was to come. Then the world will know that these are my disciples. Don't let what's going on in the world rip us apart too, or the community at large. But let's be a glue and a city and a hill and being subjects and citizens of a kingdom that have convictions and will not stand for immoral things and injustices. On the other hand, be accepting and loving and seek to understand what my brothers and sisters are going through. And let's not look at the same things and come out with different dispositions and be in judgment of one another. Jesus, in, when he told the story about the 99 sheep and the one that was lost, the 99 that are okay, he says, you leave them. The one that's broken and lost will go after it. And so whatever we see and we can put a hand to, let's go ahead and do. If that means towards mental illness, amen. If that's towards molestation, then, then amen. If that's to equal pay, then that's amen for, for, for gender. If that's toward injustices and racism, then 
at that too. And so that's my thought about really making sure that as the body of Christ corporately, that we come under the umbrella of Jesus Christ. May God grant us the wisdom and the patience and the love to deal with this. And we will all come out of this understanding that through it all, God does his best work. His best work when it seems like all is lost. Let's not lose our way. Let's be a light that people can be drawn to and say, that's how. That's how we live. Amen. So, um, you know, uh, thank you guys uh, for, for being uh, fantastic disciples. What do you guys think? Uh, what do you guys think about, you know, uh, there's no right or wrong. And, and what do you guys think about what I'm saying? Uh, have I lost my mind? And, uh, uh, and, and you know, in, in some of these scenarios, we cannot um, uh, let this go. And I think I would not be uh, doing the right thing and not say something what I through the filter that I live. And because if someone thinks differently, I want to know why. Why do you think differently? Let, help me understand. And, and, and so that we can continue to fa have a unity where people are going to say, man, these guys think differently. But look, they're just amazing in their unity. They're not conforming, but they're unified.